This video is brought to you by Raycon. There are a lot of great Assassin's Creed games, and a lot of bad ones too, but there are a few spin-offs that I don't hear people talking about too often within the mainstream community. Bloodlines, Freedom Cry, and Liberation, to name a few. Much like some of the other handheld games gets reasonably overshadowed by the larger main titles in the franchise. A feeling I couldn't shake while playing Assassin's Creed Liberations, though, was that it was set up for failure. Of course, any game that releases on a handheld is going to reach a smaller audience than it would if it were sold on a console. And you might be saying, well wait, the 3DS had games that sold millions of copies. And that's certainly true, but this game was released for the PlayStation Vita. For a brief history, the PlayStation Vita was Sony's answer to the 3DS, a handheld console capable of providing on-the-go gaming with what were, at the time, pretty solid graphics. Unfortunately, despite launching with a decent selection of titles and eventually receiving some great titles like Gravity Rush, the best game ever created, and Persona 4 Gold also the best game ever created, sales were not up to snuff in the West, and while in Japan the console was performing better, it wasn't taking down the colossal 3DS. It just seemed that people weren't interested in the PlayStation Vita, and I can speak from experience with this one because, growing up, I didn't know anyone besides myself that had one, and even mine got swiftly subjected to being a dust collector. Couple this with the fact that the Vita was pricey compared to the 3DS and even the device's sister console, the PlayStation 3, and it's no wonder that the system failed. It was able to carve its own niche within the indie scene, but its mainstream appeal had faltered. So, shockingly enough, as far as this game was concerned, it was a success and sold well. So why then did I give Assassin's Creed Liberation the subtitle of Doom to Fail? Well, it's because the restricted hardware, scope, and budget prevented this game from realizing its ideas and cementing itself as a memorable title. On the upside, thanks to the game's lower projected sales and by virtue of its spin-off label, the game was able to experiment with a number of things, some of which being engaging mechanics I would like to see return to, and others, not so much. This game sees you playing as Aveline de Grandpé. And by the way, I'll simply be using the more English-friendly pronunciations of the characters' names throughout this video, so you won't have to suffer through too much of my awful French. Regardless, Aveline is a French assassin fighting for justice within the late 1700s Louisiana, more specifically New Orleans. The game was released on the PlayStation Vita and eventually remade for consoles and PC under the subtitle of HD, and then done so again with the remaster of Assassin's Creed 3 with the subtitle of Remaster. So yes, this game is basically Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation HD remastered, but we'll just call it Liberation. Unfortunately, Ubisoft neglected to clarify the difference between the two releases of these games, so I'd assume that Liberation HD was the most up-to-date version of the game, but it is in fact Liberation Remastered, which can only be purchased through purchasing Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered. The reason this annoyed me was because I did not realize this until I finished the game on the HD port. Honestly, the only major difference between the HD port and the remaster is that the lighting is slightly better, but honestly, if you look at some of the side-by-sides, you'll see that even this is up for debate. The problem I have with this is that they're selling the Liberation HD port as a standalone, but not the remaster. So I just felt that this was a really confusing way of separating the two, especially considering that the original Assassin's Creed 3 is not available and only the remaster is. By the way, we'll be spoiling all of Liberation within this video, so how does this game hold up after all these years, and does it pass as both an acceptable handheld game and a standalone product? Let's find out. So normally, I look at a game's presentation pretty broadly, and without going into too much detail, but that's going to be different this time around because this game's presentation is its weakest asset, and it significantly brings down the rest of the game. I understand that clearly, the budget wasn't high enough to give this game the same polish of a full console release, but some of the decisions here really make me question if these jagged edges around the game's polish are due to budgetary restrictions, time restrictions, or just laziness. Take a look at one of the mid-game cutscenes where we find the captain of a ship drunk, and we need to speak with him. There's no sounds aside from the voiceover. It makes these scenes feel distractingly silent, especially when the captain falls over and we hear nothing. Secretive man. Thank you for your time, Capitan. <laughs> Not even the sounds of Avalon's footsteps as she walks away. Her footsteps are present in gameplay, but I'd argue that not having them present as your boots slam into the rooftops is more important, because in every Assassin's Creed game they sound so satisfying, and that's no different here in gameplay, which as far as polish goes, beats out the cutscenes any day. Ha, 
The cutscenes also suffered from being too close at times. You often saw characters' faces and imperfections way too clearly and with static camera shots, but in gameplay you're almost constantly moving and focusing on the task in front of you rather than the noticeable polygons on an enemy's face. In conjunction with the lower polygonal counts on the enemies, you'll notice a lack of buildings in some areas, but I never thought this impacted gameplay in any significant way. It certainly got in the way of the leap of faith though, which is disappointing to say the least. When synchronizing, there's often a swell in the music and with it comes a spectacular frame rate that makes me wonder what the hell happened here? I initially thought that it was a pre-rendered cutscene, but no, your position on the viewpoint is reflected in the scene, so I assumed it's a similar issue to the slideshows in Origins, so I'm just gonna chalk it up to the old Ubisoft game on PC gag. Outside of performance, the music that swelled from before just stops, and it leaves you with an awkward silence. I mean, the game doesn't need any major symphonies, but at least some ambient music would have been nice. A really underappreciated feature that a lot of games take for granted is dynamic music. We saw this in Assassin's Creed 3 as the tempo of the music rose during combat and fell during more peaceful frontier traversal. In Liberation, it isn't uncommon to hear the background music stop for a moment and then transition to something else. <laughs> which was jarring and pulled me out of the experience a few times. I think this could be fixed by adding a softer fade in and fade out, but honestly, I really feel like I'm nitpicking on this one. At least the music itself sounds really good, and it's clear that while the selection of songs here may be far lesser than its older brother, the quality hasn't dipped at all. While it is true that there are plenty of reused songs here, thanks to the game's shorter length and because again, the music is great, it was never really a bother. Listening to these songs, though, is only enjoyable with a solid pair of earbuds, and that's where Raycon comes in. Despite this coming as a shock, I do leave my house every now and then, and most frequently to get to my university, which is quite a ways away, meaning that there's a lot of downtime on the train. So it's easy to see how appealing a nice pair of earbuds are, especially ones such as the Raycon Everyday Earbuds. It has such an appropriate name because these bad boys will become what you use every day. Eight hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life ensure that you can jam at any time with surprisingly fantastic audio considering how the Raycons will run you half of the cost of your typical premium earbuds. If premium sound without a premium price isn't enough, then perhaps the 48,000 five-star reviews will be. If that is enough, feel free to hit up the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com aqua to get 15% off of your purchase. Something I absolutely love about the Raycon Everyday Earbuds is just how well they fit in your ear. Whether that's during exercise or when you aggressively throw your head back after an 11-year-old rips yet another victory royale out of your hands, these things will not move. And that's thanks to the comfortable gel tips. On top of being sturdy, they're also insanely small, meaning they fit in your pocket, backpack, or anywhere else with ease. The earbuds themselves are in the same boat, meaning that these earbuds will fit snug under any toque during those cold winters as they fit flush against your ears. They also come in a variety of colors. I decided on the blue model, so again, if you want some sturdy, premium sounding, and feeling headphones without the premium price, then go to buyraycon.com aqua or click the link in the description to get 15% off of your order. You'll be supporting the channel and you'll be able to listen to these very videos and your favorite tunes like never before. Before. I know I harped on a lot of minuscule things here, but I only do so because these individual issues are all existing within one another. In any given cutscene, you'll see, or rather hear, no ambience, sounds, and what you do see is interrupted by choppy animations or cutscenes that flat out feel incomplete. There were many points where a cutscene was rendered pointless because it was either so short that it gave very little context, and what little context can be drawn from some of these cutscenes is then explained near immediately after in a dialogue pop-up. Not every cutscene has this feeling of being incomplete, but the cutscenes usually go for a show don't tell approach, very nice, but then forfeit it right after. For example, Avalyn, her father, and her stepmother are all having dinner together. In this cutscene, it's clear that her father is pressuring her into marriage and living an otherwise normal life. Meanwhile, her mother encourages her to explore, of course not knowing about her nightly escapades. Because her stepmother shares her views on slavery, the two get along far better than her and her father. And this is shown to us. In my books, that's a perfectly good cutscene. But afterwards, we're shown a dialogue box that explains what the cutscene just did. And so I wonder why I even have them at all. Do they think their players aren't gonna watch the cutscenes and pay attention to them? I don't know. Take a look at another cutscene, this time from the beginning of the game. Avalyn meets with a slave who is being abused, saves her, and then she's just transported back home. This was such a strange transition because at this point we don't even know where Avalyn is going or why, and this would be a perfect time to have a dialogue box that says, Avalyn went home to ask her stepmother for assistance in aiding the injured slave. You may have noticed that I haven't mentioned animations or fidelity much, which is odd because I usually focus on those things, but that's just because this game looks pretty similar to Assassin's Creed 3 and even uses the same engine. So overall it looks pretty good and similar, though in some cases the game can be pretty bright and it honestly looked great here, but the near constant presence of particles on the screen could be seen as distracting or just unnecessary. There are certain design decisions like the objective markers being these large circles that were made to be easier to spot on the 5 inch Vita display, but that's about the extent at which you're reminded of this game's handheld origin. 
regions outside of the jank. Louisiana looks good here, and so do the other locations you visit, even if brief. Traveling to New York for a mission which sees Avalon in some winter attire and climbing a frozen waterfall, but it was also a change of pace from the dark and muddy bayou, which acts as a frontier equivalent to this game. There are alligators and muggy waters here that serve to the same function as the snow in the frontier, and you'll make use of your tree running abilities, which also make a return. Climbing trees to synchronize in the bayou was a lot more fun than the frontier because the trees had unique ways of being climbed. I enjoyed climbing viewpoints more knowing that it wasn't the same model, just slapped everywhere across the map, like it was in Assassin's Creed 3. Also, wrestling alligators is a thing. It's a quick time event, but it's here. It's kinda cool. The gameplay is in a similar spot as the presentation in that there are a lot of mechanics that are the exact same as a companion game, and that's perfectly fine, but it gets better when we see the new mechanics here and how decent they actually are. Avalyn's biggest ace up her sleeve is her intersectionality. These are represented within her three personas or disguises, the lady, the slave, and the assassin, and all have interesting quirks and strengths that will work better for different situations. The lady persona is all about being charming and unassuming. In this persona, your movement is heavily limited and you can only perform assassinations with your hidden blade and later on your parasol gun which can fire both poison and berserk darts at a target. The biggest perk with this disguise is that in nearly every area, guards will not suspect you, and guards can even be charmed and lured away from their posts. Is a guard blocking your path? Put on the moves and lead them to a secluded location for some deadly penetration. Of course, the issue is that this is wildly inefficient compared to just killing the guard right there or climbing over the wall next to him. It at least works for anyone wanting an extra challenge or to fulfill some kind of roleplay. Naturally, this is the least useful persona and it is very situational but it does have a few moments to shine like in a late game mission where you infiltrate a ball. I think a major issue with this outfit is that your combat limitations aren't really limitations. You can still counter kill any enemy and while taking away most of your weapons will limit you, it is negligible. Every weapon does the job the same way, as it has since Brotherhood. So the game isn't taking away your weapons, they're just taking away your aesthetic choices. I can at least say I like the trade off here of not being able to jump or sprint and I appreciate that Avalon being a female assassin, the first we played as at this point, is used outside of a model swap. She makes use of femininity and it allows her to get a leg up on her victims. But this is just one life that Avalyn lives. She also, while not living the life of a slave thanks to her father and stepmother, is capable of wearing a slave disguise, allowing her to sneak around plantations and make use of some greater movement. She has a full range of motion here, however she cannot use all of her weapons like the Lady Persona. Fortunately, her major advantage is the ability to blend with crowds. That's right, this can only be done with this Persona, and as for drawbacks, you are again limited in weapons, and again, it makes little impact. But I will have to come back to this Persona later, because the reason it's so useful is because of the shortcomings of the Assassin Persona. To clarify, each persona can blend and hide to an extent, but the slave persona makes full use of crowd blending. The assassin persona is your basic assassin attire, with all the weapons and full range of motion in both traversal and combat, however you can't blend with crowds using this persona. This is obviously the most ideal persona for combat, because it allows you to perform chain killing, and even execute a chain kill ability. This ability, unlike the chain killing present in the other games, and this one, where after killing one enemy the next can be instantly killed, is initiated by pressing the left bumper and then highlighting the enemies you want to kill, and then hitting the button again. After that, you might as well put the controller down because the game just kind of plays itself. The thing I don't understand about this ability is that you can already do it quite easily, and even then it takes a little effort. Sure, some enemies like the Brutes need to be stunned before they can be chain killed, but damn, it's not rocket appliances, and giving us the ability to delete three enemies for free, especially when the game never throws more than a small handful at you, feels so strange. I found myself not really using this ability much because it was so easy to take down enemies as it is. So now going back to the slave outfit, we can see that as far as stealth goes, it's the best option. If you're planning on open combat, then by all means, use the assassin attire, but where this becomes an issue is in the game's objectives, which will in arguably too many cases see you forced into stealth, in instant fail if detected conditions. Normally, I hate instant fail stealth missions, and this even goes for Assassin's Creed 3, but here the enemy layout was manageable and the detection speed was often forgiving, so I only failed the mission when I really messed up, so I don't mind the requirements here. Full sync requirements are back and they're actually pretty tolerable this time around. Some of the later sequences in this game were tough as nails, but overall not enough to cause too much frustration. That is unfortunately all that's new here on the gameplay front, but at least a new tool for you here is the whip, which was fine. It works like a rope dart where you can bring enemies closer to you, but outside of looking admittedly cool, it didn't do much for combat as enemies naturally close the gap with you. Everything else like parkour and movement was fine, though I did find myself getting stuck on objects more than I did in previous entries, and I had a few occasions where I went somewhere I didn't intend, but again, it was rare. The new whip can be used to swing across gaps, but unfortunately, it lacks any fluidity or style. 
unlike its use in combat. You have to press the right trigger, forward on the stick, and the jump button all at the same time in order to properly activate it, but it only works when stationary. If you're already holding those buttons down when you approach, then you'll just jump off. It was pretty frustrating when during a puzzle or action sequence, I was just killed because I tried to have some momentum going into the swing. Instead, we have to sit for a moment, do the swing, and then we can keep moving. Overall, the addition was fine, but with some tweaking, it could have been way more fun. There's also underwater exploration here, which serves as a precursor to Black Flag, and it's at least one thing that this game does better than its parent game. So I mentioned that gameplay here is much the same as Assassin's Creed 3, and while that is true at its core, that's as far as it goes. This game takes a relatively simple and safe approach to its missions, and that's not to say that interesting things aren't happening, but rather you won't find any in-depth sailing mechanics that are only used for two missions during the main plot, or any in-depth trading. There is still trading here, but there isn't much to it. I was initially under the impression that you could renovate your home location as you could buy change rooms around the map for you to change personas. These were cheap, however, and are about the only things you can buy outside of a few shops here and there, and they barely contribute to any sort of income. Fortunately, purchasing these change rooms is great for convenience. The individual levels themselves work well enough, with most seeing you sneaking into a restricted area, tailing a target, some assassinations, and of course, action. I think the basic run-of-the-mill assassinations are actually where the game shines the most, because of its simplicity, but the larger set pieces here are where things get a little dicey. For example, take a look at either of the two times you enter a first civilization structure. We get no dialogue from Avalyn, no shock or wonder, not even a line saying it's exactly as Agate described, or just how she remembers it. These incredible set pieces are just treated as though they're no big deal, and while fans of the series have seen Isu structures many times before this, hearing Avalyn's thoughts, hell, even a gasp would have done the set piece some favors. A similar sentiment is shared when Avalyn teams up with Connor. I, unfortunately, knew that this mission was coming, and I was so excited for it, and while from an environmental and even gameplay standpoint this works, her interactions with Connor are downright awkward. I know I kind of established that Connor wasn't necessarily the social type in my Assassin's Creed 3 video, but he makes such a brief appearance and there's barely any small time talk between the two. There is a very, very short conversation between them at the end of the memory, but it's still so short that I couldn't help but feel disappointed by the lack of interaction between the two. There are some more action-oriented levels here, like when you hijack a carriage full of gunpowder, but the levels aren't anything outside of what we've seen up to this point. Sure, on a handheld console, seeing something like this is pretty cool, but on PC or home consoles, it's not anything too noteworthy. Even memories that aren't action-packed are enjoyable, like the one where you have to tail a group of soldiers moving through the bayou. Beforehand, Agate set up voodoo structures around the bayou, and our job is to convince them that they are being cursed. So we stalk them from the trees, and when they approach a statue, we kill one with the blow dart. Seeing the crew slowly freak out was fun, and holy Holy shit, the way this guy just falls into the ground had me pissing myself laughing. There are some side quests here which are also pretty standard, and they all consist of talking to someone, then heading to a location to find and kill your target. On rare occasions, you'll tail someone as well, but that's about it. Even the more interesting side quests, like the Citizen E, are just locating and killing targets. Despite the sign content and even the main content being very, very by the numbers and simple, I found myself enjoying it for that reason. This was a relaxing side story that felt low-key across the board, and it's been a nice break from the otherwise fate of the world plots that show up in most of these games. There isn't even a piece of Eden in this game, and I know this all sounds like it's some gimped experience, or that it isn't good, and certainly there are parts of this game that need reworking, but as a package, it was easy to pick up and play around with. A lot of these games have larger modern-day plots to introduce the player to, and this game barely even bothers. Hell, even the game's opening reflects this idea of skipping the bullshit, as it just gives you a brief summary of the location and who you're playing as, and then it takes you right into it. No fate of the world or catastrophic modern day, and man, that was refreshing. I know that my dislike of the modern day hasn't been received well, but I truly think this game exemplifies how great a lack of a modern day plot really is. The plot ends up being more consistent because we aren't pulled out of the experience by some modern day conspiracy. Except we are. The Citizen E moments from earlier is a surprisingly more intrusive way of shoehorning in the modern day. And what makes this the worst is that what it's trying to say is really compelling. Essentially, we play through Avalyn's memories through an Abstergo program which has the ability to alter certain points of history. And this is done to further the modern Templar's agenda. And this is a pretty interesting concept. It works within the lore and it's something historians face frequently in our real world too. History, especially the farther back you go, can be muddied with biases and incorrect recollections. And this could be something that the game talks about, but they don't really go anywhere with it. And on top of that, it actually interrupts the story even more. Directly after finishing a quest, you'll see a Citizen E segment that makes amendments to a cutscene, and the changes were almost always so puny that I question why they even bothered at all. 
To be fair, it works as a solid setup for the fake out ending that they do, but overall the whole Citizen E and the Scholar hacking group thing was something I struggled to get interested in. Back to that introduction, we're immediately shown Avalyn as a child, and we see that her mother abandoned her at age 10. And this scene is actually a recurring nightmare of which she wakes up to as an adult, and her stepmother comforts her. As she leaves, Avalyn decides that the best way to get her mind off things is to sneak out and find some slaves to help, and when she does, she brings them back to her stepmother, and we see that both of them are trying to set as many slaves free as possible. Avalyn's duty to keep New Orleans out of Templar control sees her assassinating a governor and a defected assassin attempting to seize control of a smuggling operation within the bayou, with hopes of forcing Avalyn's mentor, Agate, out of hiding. Agate sends Avalyn on a few more contracts, and eventually she tracks down another Templar, but decides to spare him after learning that the slaves sent out of the city are being sent to an excavation site in Mexico, and in exchange for her mercy, he gives her a lens that can decode Templar documents. Avalyn then, despite her mentor's anger and distrust, makes her way to the excavation site where she finds one half of something called the Prophecy Disc. On her way out, she assassinates the leader of the excavation site and even runs into her mother, who seems afraid of her and tells her not to trust Agate. Avalyn returns home to check in on New Orleans and the bayou and protects Agate from a Templar named Vasquez, and then returns to Mexico to meet with her mother once more. They reconcile about the past and we learn that her mother was forced to abandon her and she helps Avalyn obtain the other half of the Prophecy Disc. Coming back home and being no closer to finding out about the head Templar of the operation known only at this point as the Company Man, Avalyn helps a man named George escape New Orleans to New York per request of her stepmother. Suspecting that Vasquez is the company man, she assassinates him at a ball, but finds that her assumptions were wrong. Avalyn then learns that a Templar working for the company man is working out of New York, and she, along with the help of Connor, tracks him down and finds that it's actually George, who reveals that the company man was Avalyn's stepmother all along. Returning home, we find out that Avalyn's stepmother knew about her nightly escapades, and tries to convince her to join the Templar order. Fleeing to the bayou, Avalyn attempts to receive help from Agate, but he is convinced that Avalyn is working for the Templars, and as he is ridden with thoughts of failure, guilt, and betrayal, he kills himself. Avalyn Avalyn then returns to her stepmother with Agate's necklace for proof of his death, and pledges allegiance to the Templar Order. Except that didn't happen, and after a fake-out ending, we see that in reality, Avalyn killed her stepmother and the rest of the Templars before they could use the Prophecy Disc. Using her locket that her mother gave her when she was young to use the Prophecy Disc, she sees a message from the First Civilization. And that's where the game ends. Honestly? This might be one of the most uninteresting plots I've played in almost any Assassin's Creed game. I couldn't get into it, and that's not to say the characters were bad, I mean the likes of Avalyn were great! And I like this idea of her living a double life, and you even hear when she talks to her family, she pitches up her voice and seems more innocent and unassuming, but when her stepmother leaves her, her voice returns to its normal tone. Or are you gone? In any case, the night has better uses than sleep. I like that Avalyn's double life is reflected within gameplay, and in the story as she sneaks out of her bedroom window like a teenage vigilante, and I think for a game with a smaller scope like this, it works great. I just wish the smaller scope also led to a less convoluted plot. It feels like so much happens in the story and things are just not fleshed out enough, like Agate and the Creed. I think having the Creed take a backseat here is totally fine, especially because this game's sister product dove into the deep end of the Assassin Templar conflict, but I think some things like how Avalyn became an assassin and how Agate came to be so similar to Achilles should be explained, but the game doesn't go there within the plot. Agate and Achilles aren't the only parallels here, as Avalyn also has a parental figure that's a Templar, and she even asks Connor if he is always sure about his ideals, and we know that he isn't. There's also the parallel of both of these characters being minorities, which play significant roles in both their stories, and more specifically here, in gameplay. I think the twist of the Company Man not only being a woman, as the name Company Man would not lead you to believe, but also your stepmother was interesting even if not entirely original. I like the idea that Avalyn and her mother are essentially doing the same thing, Thing, living a double life, but doing so for polar opposite reasons. Adding on to the fact that she poisons Avalyn's father, and I felt more invested but still disconnected to an extent thanks to the sound of her father gasping for air as Avalyn leaves him. How am I supposed to take this cutscene seriously with that kind of noise? Otherwise, they handled her stepmother fine. I also find it difficult to really connect with Agate too, due to how little we see of him, and the fact he kills himself to me felt like it came out of left field. Maybe this is due to the excessive time skips, which makes scenes like when Avalyn goes to Mexico for two years really weird because that two years was roughly 25 minutes of gameplay for us. Something I can appreciate about this game is that there are consistent low stakes. In the gameplay, it's very simplified, and I like a low-key experience like this, but the plot feels like it was either squeezed and cut down to fit in the six, maybe seven hour runtime, or it was stretched and a bunch of filler ended up leaving us with more questions than answers. I think not having a training sequence for Avalyn worked in the story's favor because we already got a pretty lengthy origin story for Connor, and getting straight to the assassinations was refreshing. I just wish the plot filled some more gaps in. Instead of using the pop-ups at the beginning of sequences to explain the very things we just saw, explain some of Avalyn's origin. A game like this lore 
otherwise could benefit from having loading screen facts. Something as simple as a dialogue box overlaid while in the loading screen. And this would fit into the lore of this being an Abstergo product too. Also, these loading screens look really good. Sorry, I just had to mention that. This story overall was pretty tough for me to not only get invested in, but even analyze because so much of it goes nowhere and I just ended up waiting for a lot of the cutscenes to end so I could get back to the gameplay, which was quite good considering its handheld origins. And I think that's what makes Liberation special for me. On a gameplay front and even a graphical front, the fact that this game looks and plays so similar to its home console counterpart blows me away. And what confuses me the most here is that the parts of this game that don't hold up well are not dependent on the the hardware. Sales wise and especially in the eyes of mainstream profits this game was doomed to be a failure, but it was not doomed to be a bad game. In fact it's not a bad game, but I think if we're going to cut corners to fit in with either the budget or the time constraints, leaving out audio and having the story feel half baked are some horrendous corners to cut. I think from a handheld perspective this game is fantastic and far better than some of the other handheld games I've talked about on this channel. From a console product perspective I still can't hold too much against this game because of how cheap it is, regardless of the original port which was $20 usually on sale or through the Assassin's Creed 3 remaster which while pricier if you're looking for just liberation is still a solid deal considering you're getting a full game and a full half game with a decent coat of paint. Funny enough when I made a poll asking people what the best spin-off game was a lot of people either said liberation was one of the worst Assassin's Creed games that they've played or that it was one of the best and I don't really agree with either. I think it's just a solid game. Fun for sure but it doesn't try to push any envelopes. It's low stakes and it leans completely into the power fantasy and Avalyn was a likable badass. Even Ezio fans can pop a half chub because she has the same scar over her lip that he does. I hope this isn't the last we see of Avalyn, but considering how this game is nearly a decade old, I don't know if we'll be seeing her return or any of the mechanics introduced here anytime soon. At least her first and final foray quality-wise was a solid one. Then my eyes escaped its faded failure. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this video. I just wanted to say thank you, and I wanted to say thank you to our editor, Sean, for putting this together. If you want to find his links, you can find them in the description and in the pinned comment. I want to keep this outro short because this video was short, and I apologize for that, but it's because I'm working on something big in the background. So I have two smaller videos that are going to be coming out, and then hopefully a nice big one that might be my best video yet. I'm really excited for it, and I hope it turns out well. I want to say thank you to our patrons and YouTube members, Barav Meta, Lane, Daniel Latow, and Breeze Over, Ben Conway, Bastian, Chiefy, Chris, Gonzo Benzales, Mark Short, Pyrite, Ryan Hutcherson, Sean Bailey, Toyota Jeff, and Alfednar, 845719. Thank you guys for your support. It means the world to me, helps me pay for these editors, which in turn helps me put videos out faster, and it allows me to keep up with school while also keeping up with a consistent semi-consistent upload schedule. If you guys want to become a patron, you can get access to these videos a couple days early. On top of that, you also get some behind the scenes stuff and a special chat room in the Discord server. Links to join that Discord server will be down below, as will be my Twitter, which is where I'll be posting most of my updates about videos. Again, thank you all so much for your support. Stay healthy and take care.